Will was attached already? Will was attached already. But I was like, really? Is he attached? You know, you hear this all the time. He's attached. He's attached. Okay, well, is he really attached? How am I supposed to know? I can't call Will Smith. Oh, oh, oh. oh what about this? How attached is he attached? <laughs> You are the reason that my brother Rashad and I both went to NYU. You know, they took a lot of our money, but it was worth every penny. Obviously, you're a professor to so many. You have to watch so many short films. What is it that you're looking for as a professor? <laughs> I mean, you guys, you and your brother, the, the dynamic duo. <laughs> How many years are between you guys? Probably two or three years removed from each other. You guys are doing a damn thing. I really enjoyed your latest joint. <laughs> I uh, I did this book tour thing with uh, Will. I've been telling everybody, you got to check this young filmmaker's film out. Again, congratulations. Venus Williams, what you want? Let's show all of those people that I can handle what's coming. The performances are amazing. Angenou, very overlooked actress. She was phenomenal. A pivotal role because Venus, Serena, and her sisters had a mother. Yeah. <laughs> Black moms get overlooked a lot. The way that role was written, the way it was acted, the way it was directed. Like, we know that moms hold down the fort. King Richard was doing whatever he wanted to do. He was certainly front facing while she was holding it down. Absolutely. And yeah. I knew and she she nails it. What a, what an incredible actress. Now the girls have schoolwork to do. They do their homework. Tundi's first in her class. Lynn and Isha are too. How did this come about? I always I always love to hear the origins. Like how did all these things in the universe come together in this moment of time and space. <laughs> it was one of those Hollywood moments for me. I, I would flip the script by like four different people on the same day, and they were not my agent. They slipped it on the low low? They slipped it on the low, you know, one of these slips. And I was like, why are they slipping it to me? Um, and my agent's not slipping it to me. So I read it and I was like, whoa, this is a great story. So I first thing I did was call my agent and say, how come you're not slipping it to me? He said, uh, you know, they didn't have the rights. They didn't have the rights. They wrote the, they wrote the film on spec. But the script still must have been going around though, right? It was going around, but I guess that was part of their bidding war or strategy. How did Will get it? I guess they got the studio, Warner Brothers, to get behind the project and attached Will in the process of doing that. Once Will was attached, they created this bidding war. Will was attached already? Will was attached already, but I was like, really, is he attached? You know, you hear this all the time. He's attached, he's attached. Okay, well, is he really attached? How am I supposed to know? I can't call Will Smith. To know oh, oh, oh. Oh, what about this? How attached is he attached? <laughs> how, how attached is Will? So I said, okay, let me let me just do some digging of my own. You know, I'm represented at WME and see, see what's going on. And they said, look, we represent the Williams family, and they are not behind this right now. Did they know about the script? They knew about the script, said the script was great. They had not confirmed that the family had received it or was behind it. Could this film have been made if the family said, nah? I wouldn't have made it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have made it. So I think it could have been made, and it probably would have been made, but it, it would have been a very different movie. Tennis takes expert instruction. It takes families with unlimited financial resources. It's like asking somebody to believe that you got the next two Mozarts in your house. Tell us about your first, your first meet with, with, with Willie Will. Well, that was pretty scary because, you know, of course I've grown up watching Will and I'm, you know, it's my first time working with, you know, a pretty big movie star. And so I go into the meeting, it's at CAA. And uh, in the meeting, James Lasseter, who's his longtime producing partners in the room, and so is Caleb Pinkett, and he's got tattoos all over. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Jada's his brother, his right? Jada's brother. So, and, and they're not really saying much. They're just sitting there. So I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I don't know who I'm supposed to talk to. I'm just going to sit here and talk to Will now. 
And I didn't come in, you know, Spike, they didn't teach us at, at NYU to come in with any sort of presentation. I came in like this, I had a hoodie, leather jacket, <laughs> and that was it. But actually in the middle of the meeting, Cory Booker comes in the meeting, knocks on the door, interrupts the meeting. And I'm like, oh, Cory Booker, my mom taught in Newark for 30 years. You know, so just like this happenstance meeting. He's like, oh, your mother. He sits there, records a video to my mom in the middle of the meeting. They know each other? They knew each other. He came yeah. to visit Will because we heard he was in the building. Tane to get a check for the campaign or something. <laughs> something happened, but we talked about being fathers. But look, it was poker face. Literally, like, it was like, all right, cool. Like, time's up. I left the meeting. Were they seeing a lot of directors? Apparently, they saw three directors that day. Who the other two? I heard every name in the book, you know, at some point was in the hat, but I guess they, you know, had either scheduling or price or whatever. They made the right choice. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate it. So you got Will's approval. When did you meet with the, the Williams family? Isha Price is a producer on the film, and I spoke with her before that meeting. So she was part of that initial round. And so she heard my notes on the script, what I wanted to do in terms of the family. Because in the early iterations of the script, it was really Venus and Serena. The other girls were not really flushed out. It wasn't so much the family going to the court at the same time. It, you know, So I, I told them, I said, look, I think this is like the Jackson 5. Like, we need to make this a whole family affair. Once she heard that, she was like, exactly. that We were picking up balls. We were hanging signs. And I said, well, that's the movie right there. I don't think Venus and Serena would have... Not include, they want their sisters, you know, their siblings included too. They had that, they would have done that themselves. They would have said that. I think it was just the bandwidth of the script. You know, when he was writing, it wasn't, you know, it was just, it was like, how do you fit all these characters in, giving them enough to say? And I said, look, let me worry about that and we'll figure that part out, but we have to include them in the process. So, and so look, it was working with the writer just to say, look, we need to include these elements into the script to make it a little bit more dynamic. Did you ever meet with Mr. Richard Williams? I didn't. It was just about timing and then COVID. It was a number of things that kept them from us. But I met with everybody. I met with Serena. I met with Orisine. I met with Venus. Venus and Orisine were in South Florida. So I went down to meet them and they live right next door to each other. So I, I got to meet them together. That was great. I mean, that's where a lot of the movie happened was in those conversations because it was Orisine was like, look, don't make me no chump. We hadn't cast a role yet. I hadn't cast Anjanou. She was like, look, you can do anything, but just don't make me a chump. And I was like, Anjanou Ellis ain't no chump. I'm going to get somebody that has that, that shell. And then she talked about her faith being Jehovah Witness, coaching full time, working as a nurse. So she talked about all these other things that, you know, were kind of skimmed. And she was a lot more involved than we know. Like we had seen her in the matches in the stands, but we don't really know that she was out there coaching and fixing Serena's toss. So Spike, did you know that when Thomas was the production designer on King Richard? Oh, snap. I didn't know that. Met him in your class. Third year, Tisch NYU, graduate film school. You know, I remember him coming in and talking about the work that he had done on Malcolm X and was like, man, maybe one day I'll get to work with Wynn Thomas. See how that works? See how that works? <laughs> and boom, sure enough. And of course, look, when I was making the film, I said, look, I'm doing a period piece. I'm doing a historical piece, like who has the expertise and knowledge to do something on that level? And, and being a person of color in this industry, there's very few names, sadly, there are very few names at that level. And when comes to top of mind. And so I reached out, he was the first person I thought of. I reached out, he was available. And I think it was tricky because he's in New York and I was making a film in LA and, you know, studio and getting him to come out. But I said, look, we need some folks that look like me behind the camera. It was a little bit of a fight to get him on. But once he came on, I think he really opened up that content house for us. What I love so much about your film is that the portrait of a black family that you know, there's, there's, there's stuff happening, but you know, that kind of stuff is still, you saw the love. I really felt that and thank you for that, man. I felt that deep that I saw, felt, heard black love, family. Look, they, you know, they were, it was a struggle. You know, they're growing up in Compton and to think about the father, I'm gonna have two Michael Jordans. They're like, I think you might just have the next Michael Jordan. 
don't know, brother man. I got me the next two. Negro, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I can use another word instead of Negro, <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> but he had a vision and that no one else saw. I'm, I'm, I mean, I can't say, you know, I'm not saying about moms, but very few people outside that small, strong family saw the vision, saw a dream, and he made it happen. So I don't care what anybody says about him. He's good with me. I'm sorry. <laughs> and yeah. in order to make a dream like that come true, some feelings got to be hurt along the way. <laughs> you know, what is easy? Nothing. So, you know, I, as I said before, man, I tell everybody, you got to go check this thing out. You got to check this out. Venus and Sabrina gonna shake up this world. How, how did it open up? Great. The audience response has been great. That's what's most important. Have you ever had a film that like, that hit in terms of critical, but didn't start fast, but then picked up? And I got a, I have films where it had no critical, didn't start either. <laughs> but uh, uh, one yeah. thing I've had films that come out where any catch on to years later, mm -hmm. 25th hour, Crook was like that too, found the uh, afterlife, you know, long after the, you know, initial theatrical release. The different time making films now, so, and you've been through all of those eras. <laughs> is it, is, do you find it any easier now? It still struggle me to get the stuff I want to get made. You know, the struggle still continues. I'm in my fourth decade and I'm going to keep whacking, you know, just keep it going, keep it moving. But is the struggle different or is it, is it just still the same struggle? Is it financing well, is the struggle? I mean, finance is always, is always uh, for me, the problem why it's getting made. And so now there's just more people telling me no. <laughs> there are more places to get it made, but there's more, more no's. <laughs> Somebody keeps saying yes. You just got to keep, you know, one door is going to be okay. Come on in. You just got to keep, keep knocking on them doors. This is what we want to do for the rest of our lives. So we're in it. You know, it's a battle. We know that, but we're not running from that. Mm -hmm. gotta do what we got to do. And keep telling our story. You know, you're unlike other filmmakers that you don't take a lot of time in between projects. Other people get tired and they burn out or they need five years in between projects and projects that they write, but you, you make a movie a year or, or, or more. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you, you're able to sustain that pace. When you're doing what you love is not a job. You know this, and anybody that can make a living doing what they love, you know, live comfortable, it's a win. Majority of people on this earth go there, go to their grave having worked at a job they hated. That is what I would call a living hell. Mm -hmm. But we're we're blessed because we're doing what we love. I have a question though, and I'm sure yeah. you've been asked this a million times. Yeah, ask away. As young writer directors, you know, look, I've never considered myself a director for hire, although I have been hired to direct and I've still always considered myself a filmmaker, right? A writer, director in every project I come to. But like you created joints and at some point you, you decided early in your career, like that's all you're ever going to be viewed as. You are the filmmaker. It is a film by, a joint by. That's a decision. And then I'm not going to be looked at any other way other than the creator of this project. And it's not, not everybody's put in that position. You know, sometimes you just have to direct other people's material. You have to, you given that opportunity, but you know, how do you make that switch? That was not a big thing. A great script is a great script, whether I write it or I didn't write it. So it's the material. First of all, when I started out, who's going to give me scripts? They're who the fuck I am. So I started out as solely you know, directing the scripts I wrote. But that became established. That's when I started getting scripts. And I was not of the mindset like, if I ain't writing, I don't write them on. 
I'm not directing it. <laughs> I, don't, I ain't doing that. A great script, a great script. So it's out. I, I mean, I can still have my imprint on a film that I didn't write. We as artists, we we have to be the ones that know what our narrative is, and not let some other somebody else, some other people say who you are. Nah, son, we don't. Uh -uh, we're not doing that. We know who we are. We know who we're about, and this is and and you see the the, the evidence of that. What are you doing now? Writing. Uh, reading scripts. This can be the first year in a while where we're teaching both of this end of the, the, the fall semester. I'll be teaching the spring semester too. I was one of those few students that came out with loans. And I think there was just a different like thing on my shoulder. Like I got to make it. But I mean, I, of course you, you believe in yourself, but there is that, there is that point where belief has to, has to meet something. You know, you, you have to have a little bit of luck on your way to working hard. And I, and I think that that happened. I'm going to ask you what's next. You're the hot director. I know you're getting calls and meetings and scripts flying in left and right, right yeah. and left. Yeah. Yeah. I got something. I got something. And uh, I'm, I need I need some time with my boys, though. I've got two boys by seven and three. And, you know, you have children. You have children. And I'm very curious. Your kids are grown, but they weren't grown when you were when you were hitting your stride. I made a conscious decision. I was not going to have be, get married or have any kids. So I was established. So mm -hmm. I didn't marry my wife, and I met during the release of Malcolm X. So I had films in before that because <laughs> I did not want to be a situation where I had to make a choice between me and my kids. You know, I could starve. I would not want my children to starve, you know. And that's why I love that that you had in your film, there was another parent in the house besides daddy, mommy. How many kids were in the house in the film? Five. That was not easy. And you know, I don't think Richard was cooking. I don't think he was cleaning. Rose and peas. That's about it. <laughs> Mom's was in there. She might not have gotten the claim, but he not done that alone. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you for again giving love to moms. I love your film because you showed that complexity of a, of a black family that we rarely ever see. You know and. Uh, I love the film, man. Love what hey, you're doing. Thank you. I can't wait to share it with uh, with your students. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there next week. This next wave, you keep you keep me young. You keep me young. Yeah, I'm gonna keep you young. You you got another thirty left. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in class. All right. Thank you, Spike. And why you grad Phil Mafia? What's up? <laughs>